Please take your Bibles and if you would turn with me to the book of Romans and remain standing if you would out of reverence for the God whose word we are about to read. Turn with me to the book of Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8 and I will read with you verses 12 to 17. In Romans chapter 8 verse 12 through 17 and I have, of course I am reading in the English Standard Version. So then, brothers, we are debtors not to the flesh to live according to the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons by whom we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God, and if children, then heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with him in order that we may also be glorified with him. May God add his blessing to the reading of his word. Please take your seat. As we are taking up the offering, I want to let you know that I know maybe one or two of you uh, got to the the info table in the other hall there, the cafe, late, and so all the offering envelopes were used up and gone by the time you got there. It's a regular problem we have, Um, but perhaps if you uh, have an offering that you'd like to give in an envelope recorded, uh, please see Rich uh, after the service, and there are envelopes there now. Okay, there are envelopes there now, I'm told. There you go. Uh, We are uh, finished uh, the book of Revelation for the season, and we'll resume Revelation chapter 16 in January. Uh, Next week we start our Christmas series of sermons in the book of Ruth, and this week is our annual Orphan Sunday. So it's interesting that we we are a church that believes wholeheartedly Uh, that what God has said in the Bible can never be improved upon. Amen. Amen. I was looking for some kind of sort of Baptist response to that. And and, uh, so um, thank you, Jarrett, for that. Uh, It's not my job to uh, find ways of supporting what I'd like to say to you and, and using the scripture to support what I'd like to tell you. It's my job as a teacher of the word to see what the scripture says and teach that and let whatever is on my mind or in my heart be secondary to what God has revealed in the Bible. That sounds a bit better. Thank you, Micah. Um, And so being Orphan Sunday, uh, you know, this is I think our fourth or fifth Orphan Sunday and so I've kind of used up those scriptures that speak explicitly about adoption and that kind of thing. Uh, And so what do you do? Well, you know, the word adoption appears in this text of Scripture, and I started looking at it, and as I looked at it, I thought, this is a perfectly appropriate passage of Scripture to teach any time in the life of the church, and uh, so I've chosen this paragraph of Scripture to teach this. It does have some application to adoption, but it's not about adoption. So this sermon won't be about orphan care and adoption. This sermon will be about the Word of God, and for those of you who uh, are considering getting involved in orphan care by way of adopting or taking care of foster children, uh, you will see a couple of points of connection, but that'll be about it. So really, this sermon is about Romans chapter 8, verses 12 through 17. Uh, Would you now turn in your scriptures to that passage, and let's pray. Father, we thank you for this word of scripture. We thank you, Lord, for uh, the way that you have been working in families within our own church already uh, to take care of the needy in this world. Uh, Lord, we thank you for the capacity that you give to many people to take extra um, precious lives into their homes and into their hearts. We thank you for the gifts of your Holy Spirit to benefit not only the needy in our city, Lord, but to care for those in our church. So we ask that you would continue to build your church, continue to give gifts by your Holy Spirit, continue to be a, uh, make the name of Christ a blessing to the, especially the most needy in this world, Lord. But as we turn to this passage of Scripture, I ask that, Holy Spirit, you would have full reign. I ask that, Holy Spirit, you would use this passage that you inspired through the pen of Paul to challenge us to 
open up our understanding that we would begin to step out and live the life that we are called to as sons and daughters of God, as Christians. That, Holy Spirit, you would challenge those things that we are afraid to give up and you would give us hope in the things that you have, Holy Father, in store for us by way of the inheritance that Christ has won for us. We ask that you would give us great faith and so we would become more like Christ. And we ask this in his name. Amen. The ancient city of Nineveh seems like the perfect place to begin on a sermon loosely connected to adoption, doesn't it? The ancient city of Nineveh was uh, located today just across the river from where the city of Mosul is in Iraq, and that's been often in the news over the last uh, five or uh, six years. And the city of Nineveh in ancient times had quite the reputation for, for violence, for violence, uh, human abuses. Uh, human rights abuses, uh, really like you wouldn't believe. Um, I heard a sermon not very long ago where a preacher was cataloging some of the worst uh, human rights abuses in the ancient city of Nineveh. And at the end of the list, it was quite a horrific list, at the end of the list, he paused and said, these were the ones that I felt I could share. Most of them I couldn't read out loud in a public church service. It was a terrible place, Nineveh. It was... Uh, full of bad people doing bad things. And from, from a Jewish point of view or a Hebrew-Israelite point of view, where many prided themselves on obeying God's law, you would think that when God assigned a prophet of Israel to go to Nineveh and announce their destruction, that the prophet would be happy about it. But you'd be wrong. Jonah knew what God was like. And so instead of going to preach impending doom to people he despised, Jonah ran the other way, exactly the other way, as far as he could go. He was going to head for the farthest away place that he'd heard of. I heard that same preacher say, to, for us it would be like saying, you're going to go to Timbuktu. For Jonah it was, he was going to go to Tarshish. And you know the story, he flees on a ship bound for Tarshish and uh, skipping all the details in the story, in the middle of the, 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 the voyage, he gets thrown overboard into the ocean and a great fish swallows him. And three days later, the fish vomits him out onto dry land and Jonah, at this point, resumes his journey to where God had told him to go and he heads to Nineveh as he was instructed. He goes and he does what God told him to because he could not run from God and he realized God had saved him. And so he heads to Nineveh and he preaches the bare minimum of what God had told him to say. Is this microphone on? Okay. He preaches the bare minimum of, of what God had told him to say. And then he goes outside the city and sits on a hill overlooking the city to see what God would do. And if you look with me just at Jonah chapter 3, verse 10, we get a bit of a picture of what was in Jonah's heart. When God saw what they did, that is the repentance of the city of Nineveh, how they turned from their evil way, God relented of the disaster that he had said he would do to them, and he did not do it. But, chapter 4, verse 1, but it displeased Jonah exceedingly, and he was angry. And he prayed to the Lord and said, O oh Lord, is not this what I said when I was yet in my country? That is why I made haste to flee to Tarshish. For I knew that you are a gracious God and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and relenting from disaster. Therefore now, O oh Lord, please take my life from me, for it is better for me to die than to live. The point at the end of the book of Jonah is that God is way more merciful and gracious than Jonah was. And so Jonah's readers get the point that God is much more compassionate and caring than his people are. God cares more about the most wicked, violent, pagan foreigners than his people do. 
even when his people are upstanding, upright, religious, orthodox Israelites like Jonah. And the last verse in the book of Jonah even affirms that God cared more for the animals in that city than Jonah even gave a thought to. God is still today. Don't you believe God is still today more compassionate than we are? God is still more compassionate today than the people who wear the name Christians? Do you believe that's true? God cares about lots of things more than we do. Some of them are children. The title of my sermon is God is more caring than we are. I got some information about children in British Columbia from the website of the provincial government's Ministry of Children and Family Development. And by my calculation from the the information on their website, last year of the approximately 1,350 kids in our province who are eligible for adoption at the end of last year, about 238 of them were adopted leaving about 1,100 kids eligible for adoption in our province who weren't adopted by the end of last year. And again, by my calculation, that leaves as I can figure it, as of the end of 2018, about 6,700 kids in our province in the care of the government across British Columbia. 6,700 children. There is a crying need for safe homes for 6,700 kids in our province. There is a crying need for people to adopt children who are eligible, for people to become foster parents. There's a crying need because there's 6,700 kids that God cares about a lot more than we do. And here's the question that bothers me. Where are the Christians? Most people who tell me that they could never adopt or could never foster, they mention the risks. I get it. (laughs) I understand the risks. They mention the freedom and the lifestyle that they would have to give up. You know what? I think about that almost every single day. (laughs) And I wrestle with that every single day. They mention the, the likelihood of having your heart broken. I understand that one too. Even the Christians say these things. And I say these things all the time. I complain to God with these very complaints almost every day. Some days I'm too busy and I forget. (laughs) My purpose this morning is not to guilt anyone. My purpose this morning is not to guilt Christians into getting involved in some kind of, in some way in orphan care. That's not my purpose. I don't want you to leave here feeling guilty. Guilt, you know, guilt as a motivator to do right things, guilt is a terrible motivator. So that's not my purpose. It doesn't turn out very well when it's why you do the things you should do. My purpose this morning is to look at Romans chapter 8, verses 12 to 17, in the hope that the message from this passage of Scripture will help you and me, because all the complaints that I sort of accused you of, they're they're from my heart, the, the things that I wrestle with. So my hope is that this passage of Scripture will help you and me become a little less like Jonah and a lot more like Jesus, because God cares about a lot of things so much more than we do. And some of them are children. My, my theme this morning, and you'll notice that I was too busy and totally forgot to prepare slides so you could have something to look at on the screen. Uh, but if you're writing down things on a piece of paper with a pen, here you could write down my theme this morning. If we are God's children, we should live for what He wants and wait for what we want. If we are God's children, we should live for what he wants and wait for what we want. 
And my first question this morning, because it's a sermon really about questions. There's answers, but I've organized this around questions. My question this morning first is, why aren't we more like Jesus? Why aren't we more like Jesus? Look with me at verse 12 in Romans 8. So then, brothers, I love how Paul calls us brothers. I think it's this, maybe the fourth or fifth time in the book of Romans he calls Christians brothers. He's reminding you who we are. We're not just acquaintances. We're bound together through Jesus Christ in a way that's as close as brotherhood, if, clo- if not closer. So then, brothers, we are debtors, not to the flesh to live according to the flesh. The, the reason Paul's reminding us that we are debtors, but then he tells us what we're not debtors to, he's implying what we really are in debt to. He's implying that we do have a duty, that we are under some kind of obligation, and he's kind of leaving that hanging. So he tells us what we're not in debt to, what we're not obligated to, what isn't our duty. And he reminds his Christian readers here that we aren't under obligation. That's what the word indebted means here. We aren't under obligation to live purely for the flesh. (sighs) Thanks, Paul. How many Christians really struggle with that one? We feel we're indebted, we're obligated under a duty to live according to the flesh. Did anyone come to church this morning thinking this was the duty of Christians to live according to the flesh? So why is Paul telling us, brothers, we aren't under a duty, we aren't under obligation to live according to the flesh? Why is he telling us that? I think the answer is obvious, because that's how we actually live. The way Christians live is not what one would expect, having read the previous chapters of Romans, having read of the mysteries that God has accomplished, uh, uh, that Paul has taught us about the gospel, the way God has saved us through Jesus Christ to the amazing change that God has accomplished in us by pouring His Holy Spirit into us so that you would expect people who are now saved by the grace of God, justified through faith in Jesus Christ, forgiven of our sins, reconciled to God and unified in Jesus Christ, filled with the Holy Spirit of God to be people who live really differently than we do. So he says, so then, brothers, we are, we are debtors not to live according to the flesh. One commentator made the observation that if, if you sort of tried to draw a line and separate the sheep from the goats, separate those people who serve themselves most of their lives and those people who really, really serve Jesus with their lives, and you, you put the one group on one side and the one group on the other side and drew a line, you'd find a lot of Christians, said one commentator, on the wrong side of that line. A lot of Christians. In fact, he went on further to say that really that line would drive through the middle of many of our hearts. Because in many ways, some of us, we do things that are just totally self-serving with no regard for the claim of Christ on our lives, with no regard for the fact that he is Lord that we belong to him. And then at other times, we might actually obey him in ways that show that we are serving him, and yet we're divided in ourselves. So that line goes down the middle of us, of me. I'm on both sides of that line, and so are you if you're a Christian. God is more caring than we are. And the question really we need to ask is why aren't we more like Jesus? The passage here in Romans 8 chapter, or chapter 8 verses 12 through 17 is a, it's a small part of Paul's whole book to the, letter, to the Christians in Rome, the letter to the Christians in Rome. And, and it's written to Christians. The book is written to Christians from the first verses. It assumes that the audience are, are believers In Romans, this whole letter, Paul explained that when someone believes in Jesus, he or she, he usually calls them brothers, but it's he or she, we understand that. 
That person from that point on, from the point of trusting in Jesus Christ, having faith in Jesus Christ, is supernaturally from that day on connected to Jesus, spiritually bound to Jesus. So that st- the standing that believers have before God no longer depends on what we do, but t- depends entirely upon what Jesus Christ has done. That's, that's a remarkable truth. For the first time in our lives, we don't have to look over our shoulder and wonder what the deity, God, is going to do because of what we do. He's already done it. He punished Jesus for our sins. So that we are free if we trust in Jesus. If we take advantage and, and embrace what Christ has done to save us. What God has done to show his mercy. So then our standing before God depends on Jesus, not not on how good we are or how good we can be. Do you find that good news? But God then gives believers his spirit. The Holy Spirit of God, the third person of the Trinity in, in systematic theological terms. The Holy Spirit comes to live in us and work in us and change us. He describes that, Paul describes that as life-giving power that transforms us from the inside out. And the verse just before our verses made that clear. Look with me at verse 10 and 11 in Romans chapter 8. Verse 10, if Christ is in you, and if you are a Christian, he is, Paul is saying. If you are a believer in Christ, you have received Christ. Christ is in you, and you are in Christ. So verse 10, if Christ is in you, although the body is dead because of sin, the spirit is life because of righteousness. If the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead, and you think about that, what was dead, there was no life. The blood had stopped flowing, the lungs had stopped breathing, the organs were dying and rotting, beginning to, I suppose, at, I think I misquoted a passage there, but Jesus was dead. Before any decay had set in, I suppose, but Jesus, his body was completely dead, and the Spirit here raised Jesus Christ from the dead. Do you believe that? That's the foundation of our hope as Christians, that what was dead was brought to life. He wasn't resuscitated, he wasn't revived, he was resurrected. That power of God to resurrect a dead man. Paul is saying this is the power of God in you. Look at it. Verse 11. If the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. So why aren't we more like Jesus? Where's the life-giving power that should make a dramatic difference in the way we actually live? The point in verse 12 that we already read is that we are now duty-bound to serve Jesus, our Lord. We are, but you wouldn't know it just by watching a day in the life of Joe Christian. Or any one of you as well. The reason we don't live very much like we are duty bound to the Lord Jesus. Is because we really don't take our duty very seriously. I picked on Jonah for a reason. Poor Jonah. He was a prophet of God. And he literally ran away from what God was calling him to do. And then when he thought he was going to drown in the sea, he really thought he was dying. God saved him. He snatched him up by means of a great fish. It's a miracle. And he delivered Jonah from what was seemed to be sure and certain death. And Jonah was exceedingly happy at the end of that passage in Jonah chapter 2 when he's praying to God and, and thanking God for his salvation. He says, salvation belongs to the Lord. And in the very next breath, almost, 
says, but Lord, don't give that salvation to Nineveh. Thank you, Lord, for saving me. Just please don't save them. So God sent him to Nineveh, and eventually Jonah obeyed. And when he went and obeyed and went to the city of 120,000 souls, it says in Jonah chapter uh, 4, when he went to the city in, in, of Nineveh and he preached the message because he was going to obey God, you would think he would give it his all. You would think he would preach a great sermon. You would think he would hold revival meetings and endeavor to lead the city to repent and be saved of the doom that was coming upon them. But he traveled into the city and preached five words in Hebrew. In, in English, it's 40 days and Nineveh shall be destroyed. And the whole city repents and believes and asks God for forgiveness. The whole city even the animals, it said, they covered with sackcloth to show the repentance of the people. When the people of Nineveh responded wholeheartedly to Jonah's very half-hearted sermon, it gave hope to every preacher alive. <laughs> it showed the mercy of God that the Holy Spirit could do something so powerfully beyond our contribution. When the people of Nineveh listened to this warning of Jonah, this half-hearted, bad sermon, and the whole city repented, and the whole city was saved, and God relented of his anger that he had said he would pour out on them, Jonah became very angry that God showed them mercy. And Jonah was happy that God saved him, but so angry that God saved them. Are you a Christian who sometimes runs from what God is calling you to do? Are you a Christian who sometimes obeys God, but half-heartedly? What does God want you to do? that you aren't doing? What has God called you to do to obey him that presently you are disobeying? Some are called to ministry in the church, full-time ministry, to be a pastor. Some are called to a much more holy endeavor, to be a missionary. My sister's a missionary, so she's holier than I am. So therefore, I think that way. Some are called to honor God in their sexual relationships. Some are called to give of their money or their time in ways that are sacrificial. Some are called to foster or adopt. but all are called. What is God calling you to do? What does God want you to do? My next question is, why aren't we more for Jesus? Really, why aren't we more for Jesus? Look with me at verse 13. That was all verse 12. It's going to get quicker as we go on. Verse 13, for if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. There is a way of living that ends in dying, and there is a way of dying that ends in life. Option A. You let your gut guide you. You make decisions based on what you want to do. Sounds pretty good. Sounds so Canadian. It's 2019. How you feel, what you crave, what appeals to your flesh, 
These are your normal motivations. Option B, the Holy Spirit guides you. The Holy Spirit convinces you and restrains you to make more and more decisions against what you want and in line with what he wants. He calls you to put aside how you feel, not to altogether ignore it, not to say it doesn't matter how, what's going on in my heart, to uh, uh, be aware, but then to put that aside. how you feel, to deny what you crave and to resist what appeals to your flesh. The first way, option A, feels like living at the time, doesn't it? Doesn't it feel like living when you get to do what you want? Don't we say, now we're really living, baby. And yet it, it only feels that way for a brief time. And then you're really dead. Option B, it so often feels like dying, doesn't it? It feels like dying, but only for a short while, and then you will really get to live. Christians, this is our struggle, isn't it? The difference between people who choose to live for themselves and people who choose to put to death the deeds of the body, verse 12. The difference between those kinds of people is that this second group is living for Jesus, letting him be king, letting him call the shots, letting what he wants rule our lives in short, we're praying the same way Jesus prayed, Father, not my will, but yours be done in me. That's what it means here when Paul says, if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the, the body, because it's by the Spirit of God, it's by the Holy Spirit that you kill off your self-serving, your flesh desires. It's by the Holy Spirit, and it doesn't happen any other way. In verse 13, that's the promise, and it's a promise in verse 13. It's a fact, but this fact has a condition to it. Look at verse 13 again, and notice the conditional word there, if, if, Paul is trying to get you to fight your flesh. He's trying to get, he's trying to motivate you. He's saying, Christian, wake up. And right now I'm saying, Christian, wake up. <laughs> he's trying to urge you, to, to convince you, to persuade you, to get you to change in some way. And he's saying, if. If you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if. By the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body. You will live. You will. I know there are some who have stopped trying to stop sinning. I know there are some who have resigned the battle. Because it's too painful. It's too painful every time you fail, every time you are defeated by your sin. It's too painful to face that guilt again. It's too painful to just daily, just daily keep trying only to daily keep being defeated. And so you eventually sort of quit. And you give up the fight. You resign yourself to who you really are and you just let the, 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 the pain be numbed by giving up or giving in. But in verse 13, this is a promise. This is a promise in verse 13. And so I need to ask you, does it seem 
like if you make it your mission, your personal mission in life to kill off the deeds of the flesh, if you make that your ambition, your war that you are waging for the rest of your existence, if you make that your ambition to go to war with your self-serving sinful habits and behaviors, to fight and battle what's wrong in your heart, does it seem like you might always lose? And your sin might always win? What does verse 13 promise? If you are fighting your sin by the Spirit, you will live. You will live. Not maybe live. Not hopefully live, cross your heart, hope to die. Not live if it's God's will. He is telling you his will here. If by the Spirit of God you put to death the deeds of your body, you will live, God says. Because the Spirit always wins. So my next question, why aren't we at peace with our sin? Why aren't we at peace with our sin? Why isn't it just okay? To give up and just enjoy our sin. Why can't we relax and just say, you know what, that's who we are. Look at verse 14. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. We can read that sons and daughters in these occasional places. It's inclusive. Sons and daughters of God, children of God. And the word I want you to hear notice is the word led. All who are led. In Greek, it's, it's passive and it's continuous. It's present tense in Greek, which means a continuous sense. So it's all who are being led. And I, I don't know if our little boy has superpowers. I think maybe. I think he has a superpower when he doesn't want you to pick him up as he did this morning. I was, I was going to say this happened very recently, even last night, even on the ferry, but it happened much more recently now, so you, you, maybe you saw. He has a superpower when he doesn't want, you know how when you pick up a child, you've got natural handholds, armpits, you know, knees, you know, other places, uh, but when our little boy doesn't want you to pick him up. He goes floppy. <laughs> just, just kind of, all the cartilage and skeleton just seems to evaporate, and it's just uh, jellyfish. jellyfish. It's, it's, it's goo. There's no substance. There's no place to hook your hands under, because the armpits disappeared. He goes floppy, and just, pff, he's wiggling jello on the floor. And, and that's when you're trying to lead him anywhere, you try to pick him up by the hand, he's like, and he's just on the floor, and, you've got to, and you feel like you're going to dislocate his shoulder if you pull. <laughs> the superpower of floppiness. <clears throat> but I also have superpowers, and he, doesn't even, he do, can't even comprehend yet the powers that I have, because I have 210 pounds of middle-aged muscle. And in a contest between my brute strength and a three-year-old's floppy powers, I will prevail. Nine times out of ten. and Eight times, maybe. Eight times out of ten. Let's say it's eight times. Eight times. Even when he really doesn't feel like going where I'm leading him, even when he really doesn't feel like going where I'm, where I'm leading him, he will be led. It's a case in point. My next dramatic, dramatized sermon illustration will be dying to self. When our floppy little toddler doesn't want to be led, he will be led because I am the one who's going to win. But the Holy Spirit is not me. The Holy Spirit is not you know, a, a middle-aged, former 
average softball player. <laughs> the Holy Spirit is God, omnipotent, almighty God. That's the verb we're talking about in verse 14. All who are led. All who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. And it's a promise. If you are being led, no matter how floppy and resistant you get, if you are being led by the Spirit to fight against your flesh, it's a very encouraging sign that since God has not yet given up on you, you belong to him. You are his child. You are his son or daughter. And he will win. Praise his holy name. But being led how? Does the Holy Spirit in you let you get away with feeling content and peaceful about the sin in your life? Does the Holy Spirit make it easy for you to just go along with your sinful behavior, your habit, your addiction, whatever it is? Does the Holy Spirit say, it's okay, be at peace with your sin, with your rebellion, with the evil in your heart? No. Or like verse 13, in your experience, daily, does the Holy Spirit lead you to put to death the deeds of your body? Does the Spirit prompt you, urge you, convict you, and lead you to take arms, to take aim, to take the fight to your sin and take no prisoners. But you really like your sin. So you collapse to the ground and you can't imagine living without your sin and you go all floppy. But the Holy Spirit isn't me, as I said. The Spirit is God. And the Spirit of God Paul is talking about is Almighty, he is omnipotent, he is all-wise, all-knowing, holy. And he hates the evil that you love more than him. And when he leads you to fight against the deeds of your flesh, to fight against the deeds of your own flesh, to refuse, to resist, to deny, to withhold, to starve, to defer, to withstand, to suffocate, to remove, to thwart the things that your flesh really wants to keep doing for the sake of what He, God, wants you to do. He will win. He will win. And you will live. And it's a wonderful reassurance, isn't it? Isn't it a wonderful promise here that you are not a spiritual orphan? You are not unwanted or unclaimed? That you are a son or daughter of God. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. If we are God's children, we should live for what God wants. And then that means that we should be willing to wait for what we want. The wonder of the Holy Spirit's leading is that he changes our behavior by changing our hearts. Paul is writing this to persuade his, reader, his readers, to argue with his readers, to convince them. Look at all the, the, the connecting words in verse 12, so then. In verse 13, four. In verse 14, four. Verse 15, four. That's a lot of fours. He's making a logical argument that's compelling. Are you listening? So first, Paul tells us in verse 12, what we are, we are debtors, yes, not to what you think. We are debtors to the Lord. He tells us what we are in order to change the way we think about our lives. Verse 12, then he tells us what will happen to us in verse 13 in order to change the way we now act. And then in verse 14, he tells us again who we are, sons of God, to change the way our hearts are towards God. Because our hearts, my friends, are not right 
in how we approach God, how we feel about God, how we think about God. If our hearts were right, then our lifestyles would be dramatically different. So my last question. I know it seems way too soon to be coming to the end of my sermon. My last question is, why do we doubt our Father's plans? Verse 15. For you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear again. I'm supplying that word. But you have received the spirit of adoption as sons by whom we cry, Abba, Father. Paul's speaking in the past tense in verse 15. And he's then reminding his readers what has happened to them if they're, if they're Christians, if they're believers in Jesus, if we've received the Holy Spirit, if we began to be led by the Spirit to what He wants in our lives, it was the beginning of a dramatic change of a lifelong battle against sin. And that battle has many, many defeats, doesn't it? Many discouragements along the way. When we fail to do what we know God wants us to do, fear creeps back in where it doesn't belong anymore, doesn't it? Fear creeps back in and we begin to forget the love of Christ who purchased us with his own blood and who presented us to his Father as sons and daughters for adoption. When we received the Holy Spirit, when we believed in the Son, we became adopted children of the Father permanently and forever, eternally. Which should, shouldn't it? It should lead us to pray with a new kind of confidence. It should lead us to pray with bold confidence to God. It should lead us to turn to God for strength and for courage. It should lead us to lay down our selfish hopes, our dreams that are just purely self-centered. It should lead us to plead with Him for strength in our struggle, for faith in our temptation, for hope in our depression. But so often we totally neglect this access we have as children of God. We totally neglect the prayer that we can come to at any point to the Almighty and ask like a child to his father, Abba, Father. And so often neglecting this prayer that we have, this gift. Instead of turning against the deeds of the body, verse 13, we turn to them. Instead of following the Spirit, verse 12, we live according to the flesh. Yesterday we attended a funeral of a dear friend and brother to me. A man who served on Beacon Church's external task force up until we had elders ready to lead the church. This man taught me to preach. This man, as I shared with him shortly before he died, taught me to live with an unusually strong wife. He had a, a wife who's so similar to Heather in so many ways. And he just taught me at a very early age as a pastor, man up, Joe. He taught me to preach. He showed me what it's like to, to take a passage of the Bible and teach that. He showed me what integrity was like. He walked what he talked all the time. At the service, I remembered what I'd forgotten, that while they pastored a number of churches, they endured some terrible hurts at the hands of some of the churches they served. They suffered some opposition and rejection that was heartbreaking. One of their sons shared how it had affected him. And although he said he never ever heard his dad complain about any of the people that were hurting them. Rod, my brother, obeyed when Jesus called and he went where the Spirit led. Over long enough that it's hard to remember 
what he was like before he gave his life to the Lord. There were pictures so we could see hot rods and sunglasses and that kind of thing. But looking at his life now, it's not hard to see how the Spirit of God led him, transformed him, and showered him with grace upon grace upon grace through Jesus. His last words to me were a specific prayer to the effect that the Spirit would keep working in him. He knew he was about to die. And he wanted the Spirit to keep working on him right to the last minute. So that he would want what God wants now and wait for what God has in store for his children. Look with me at verses 16 and 17. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, provided that we suffer with him in order that we may also be glorified with him. The word glorified there is sort of a catch-all word in this case. It's, it's saying on that day when Jesus returns and resurrects us from death to life and gives us immortal bodies, on that day when we cross over from sin to righteousness forevermore, from death to life forevermore, from imperfection to perfection, from mortal to immortal. On that day when that transition happens at the return of Jesus Christ, we will experience all of who God is. We will become most like Jesus Christ in his righteousness and holiness. We will become images of God the way humanity was created to be in the first place we will be glorified and we will stand in the presence of glory and we will see it with no sunglasses needed we will see it as we are face to face glory when the spirit convicts you of sin does it feel some, like something is being taken from you? He's asking you to give something up? Is that what it feels like? When he leads you to deny your own selfish desires, does it make you afraid you might miss out in some way? If he calls you to become a preacher, bless you, my child. Are you afraid of the, the, the hardships that might come with that call? Well, you should be. But let's talk. If he calls you to foreign missions, are you afraid what it might cost you? If he calls you to do what's right, what's right? Are you afraid it will cost you your promotion or your job? If the Spirit calls you to say no to a romantic relationship with an unbeliever, are you afraid this might be your last chance for love? If the Spirit calls you to a life of singleness, are you afraid that you will be lonely forever? If He calls you to adopt a child, are you afraid of the risks? If he calls you to foster a child, are you afraid of the commitment and the sacrifice? God is more caring than we are, isn't he? God is more compassionate than we are. Certainly more than Jonah. God saves the worst people and calls people like Jonah to be the instruments of that gospel, that hope. He adopts the most undeserving of sinners, people like you and me. God adopts people like us at infinite cost. That's a bad deal for God, economically speaking. And he calls us to follow and obey and live for him. God doesn't call every Christian to get involved in adoption or foster care, but he does call every one of his children to make radical sacrifices, to do really hard things. And to love people like Jesus loved us. So when the Spirit calls us and leads us and convicts us and compels us and urges us, Paul says 
He is witnessing to us. He is testifying to us. He is speaking to us about who we are just as loudly as if he performed some miracle in our lives. Because it is a miracle when the Holy Spirit of God leads us to do what he wants and wait for what we want. Because the ones he leads are children of God and the ones he calls are adopted sons and daughters through Christ Jesus. One of the dumbest things about my master's degree was when I finished all that hard work and my family sacrificed so much, they gave me a piece of paper which says in like gold-colored letters and fancy script on this, on this paper, it says that I am entitled to all the rights and privileges of, so attached to having this degree or something like that. And it's always seemed like a very empty promise. <laughs> what rights and I was like... I want to find more about those rights and privileges, but no one answered my question. But when we adopted our sons, they became family. They became entitled to not only our name, although I thought that was pretty good. They didn't think so at the time. <laughs> they became entitled to, to being our sons, to being siblings with our other children to having all the rights and privileges of being part of our family. Can you imagine what happens when God adopts you? When God makes you his child, what you receive, what rights and privileges come with being a son or daughter of God? What you receive far outweighs Whatever it will ever cost you to obey him. Do you believe that? Do you believe God is good? Do you believe he is your father through Jesus Christ? What you will receive in glory, you can't imagine it. It will far away anything you ever have to give up now. Any suffering you ever have to go through now, any hardship, any loneliness, any pain, any discouragement will not compare to what he is preparing for you. Is obedience hard? One of you is honest, yes. Obedience is hard. But it ends in life. It ends in life. Doing hard things because God leads you, it doesn't usually make them easier. Sometimes it just gets hard and hard and harder. Sometimes the right choices lead to very long-term hardship that might never get easier, sorry, that might not get easier for a long time. But then there is glory, my friends. Jesus already sacrificed more and endured more than you will ever have to in order to secure for us, for you and me, an inheritance beyond our wildest and happiest dreams. But the Spirit, by Him, by the Holy Spirit of God, you can live now for what God wants and you can wait for what you want. Look with me again, just let's read verses 12 to 17. So then, brothers, we are debtors not to the flesh to live according to the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons by whom we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with him in order that we may also be glorified with him. Don't doubt your heavenly Father's plans for you. Embrace his will and obey him. Let's pray.
Father, I ask in the name of Jesus Christ, who is now sitting at your right hand, enthroned in all glory and majesty and power forevermore, I ask that according to the gift of the Holy Spirit whom he gave to us, the Spirit whom he sent to take residence in and indwell every one of his children, I ask, Lord, that by the encouragement and the confrontation, by the conviction of your word, Lord, this morning in Romans 8, I ask that the Holy Spirit would use this word now to deeply penetrate, to be a crowbar, a lever, loosening some old, old resistance, some old sin, some old bitterness, some old pain, some old abandoned hope. I pray, O Holy Spirit, that you now will move in your children here and you will open up our minds and hearts to once again believe in the glory that you have in store for us, the inheritance that you are calling us to, that we would love your plans much better than our own and we would submit to your leading. I ask this, Lord, because I do want to see change in our church. I want to see change in our city. I want to see Christians change our country. And I know that adoption and orphan care is only a small part of that, but, oh, Lord, would you let your church rise up? Would you let your church be sons and daughters of God, not only privately but publicly? Father, would you glorify yourself through the obedience acts of your people? And in all ways, bring honor to the name of Jesus Christ, who is our Savior and our Lord. And I ask this in his name. Amen.